the enemy wants to stop and thwart whatever God wants to do. So I'm not going to let that freak me out. I just expect it as part of the way things work. And that's what the enemy wants to do. But uh, nothing great usually comes easy. You know that? Nothing great usually comes easy and without a fight. So we're going to have to prepare ourselves to believe enough to fight for what we believe that God is doing. And I came across this quote from C.S. Lewis. He once said this, Hardships often prepare ordinary people for extraordinary destiny. That's good. Let me say it again. Hardships often prepare ordinary people. Can anybody in this room raise their hand and say, I'm just an ordinary person? That's me. I, I'm telling you, I've shared my story. You know, I'm like, I would, you know, don't talk to people. I'm good all by myself. And then he puts me in management at McDonald's because he had a different plan for my life. I love the fact that God saw fit to send His Son so that we might have hope and a future. You realize you have hope and a future. We just got done singing about it. Because of His gift, we have a great opportunity right in front of us. Listen to this. He is willing and able to take ordinary people and make them into something great. You, you've got to grasp that. And He has promised to walk with us through all of life situations and circumstances. Yes, there will be mountaintop experiences. And yes, there are going to be some times when you are in the depths of the valley of the shadow of death. But He will not leave you. And He will lead you and guide you and direct you because He has something incredible planned for your life. And I believe that He will lead us and guide us and direct us because He has something incredible planned for this area. Not just our church, but this area. And I want to be a part of what God wants to do. So this life in which we live will require action and faith on our part. You, you can't live the Christian life without faith in action. You realize that, right? James talked about that. Faith without actions is what? Dead! You need faith and you need action in your life to live this out. And once we get our, give our life to Christ, then He is expecting us to walk with Him and in Him and let His power live in us and move through us in order to move us to where He wants us to be which is an incredible place. I'm promising you that. There are things that we will face in life, but we can trust Him. And if we will let's take upon us the responsibility that He has given to us, and He will move us into incredible places, into incredible events, incredible things to take place in our life and through our life. Are you ready for what God wants to do in your life? Are you sure? Because when you say yes, you're asking for... Turmoil, trouble, tribulation, heartache, sorrow, and joy at the same time. Right? So don't say yes by accident. Understand what you have been given the responsibility to do. So let's look at James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. But He gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Do you see the responsibility that you have? It is to trust Him with everything that is within you and He will lift you up. There is work and responsibility and faith that comes in us when we say, I want to follow you. But when we do, we can believe for great incredible things. Let's pray real quick. Father, thank You for being here today. Lord, we love You. We just lay ourselves before You today. And we just ask, Lord, that You would open up Your Word to us, that, Lord, You would encourage us, that You would help us as we look into Your Word today. I pray, that, Father, that the things that I've written down, that, Lord God, You would lead me to the right things to say and to share. And if there's something I should miss, I pray that You would help me to be sensitive to Your Spirit and that You would work it all out for Your kingdom's sake and for Your glory. We love You today. And may You be exalted in Christ's name. Amen. 
There are many things that we see in the Scriptures that are important for our relationship with God. And we see that faith is among them right at the top. It's one of the first things that we need. But last week we began this series and we began to discover who we are, our core values, and what we believe we should be about here at Bethel Temple that have been taken directly primarily from the Word of God from the New Testament believers. And we talked about last week discovering what? First, we discovered our salvation. That our salvation is in Christ Jesus. We discovered that He has a plan for our life and that we should experience Him daily. And I trust and I hope that every day this week you opened your heart to the Lord. You got in the Word and He spoke to you. And you grasped that and you were able to walk in power and might. And we also discussed that we should discover and have a desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit alive and real in our life. That's what we talked about last week. So today, I want us to see some things that I believe that are important to each believer and disciple of Christ that we should participate in or that we should realize that we need to have in our life as we pursue Him. I came across this. Carrie Weems said this, Refuse to be content with just the knowledge of God, but insist on experiencing His presence. Did you see that? Because there are a lot of people that are sitting in churches today that have got knowledge of who God is, but they have not experienced His power in their life. There's a big difference between knowledge and experience. And if we do not experience Him daily, it will be difficult for us to believe that He is in our life. So, Giving our life to Christ and asking Him to forgive us is only the beginning to that relationship. We last week talked about discovering that relationship, but I'm here to tell you that's only the beginning. There is so much more. Think about this. If you arrived at a new school or you arrived at a new job and you were just new to that situation and you sat down and you had lunch and as you were sitting at the lunch table, somebody came up and they talked to you, wouldn't you go home and say, man, I think I might have made a new friend today. I met so-and-so. And you went back to work the next day to look for them and they just ignored you. And the next day after that, they ignored you or they didn't say hi to you. How long would it take before you realize you might not have a new friend? Probably not too long, right? Well, when we give our life to Christ, there's a responsibility that we have to build that relationship. And to connect with that. Because He is there for us and He's he's looking for us. But if we ignore Him, we've missed out on something very important in our life. So here are a few things that I believe that are important and that were important to the early believers to help keep a connection with God in their life. Number one is this. The first thing is this, is that we need to pray. Prayer is important. Let me just give you some verses. I'm going to read them real fast. They'll come to the screen. I encourage you to write them down. Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. The New International Version says, It is written, He said to them, "My This is Jesus. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. In Romans chapter 15, in verse 30, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggles. How? By praying to God for me. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for whom, or for which I am in chains. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, number 8 in the New King James Version says, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In Acts chapter 12, verse 12, New American Standard Version says, And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also known or called Mark, where many were gathered together and were what? Praying. Now, I had a hard time 
you know, with all the scriptures about prayer, limited it down to about these five or six. I could have went on and on and on to help us understand that in the New Testament church and Jesus Himself saw the importance of prayer. And if Jesus saw the importance of prayer and the New Testament believers saw the importance of prayer and the Word says that my house should be called a house of prayer, guess what? We need to believe in prayer. And I had a hard time, like I said, limiting that because I want us to know and I want us to understand this, that prayer makes a difference. It does. If you can't say amen to that, then I'm going to challenge you. Start praying. You'll see it makes a difference. A huge difference. When we pray, miracles can take place. When we pray, our situation and our circumstance can be changed. It doesn't mean that it will but it can. And it can change our heart. And it can change our life. And it can change who we are inside. It refocuses our mind on what God is wanting to do in that situation and in that circumstance. And when we humble ourselves, we say, God, it's not up to me. It's up to you. But we've got to pray because we need to hear from God. Jesus Himself went and got away. Why? Because He wanted to hear from His Father. That's why every month we have a time of prayer. And whether it's on a Friday night, a Sunday mor- Saturday morning, a Saturday night, whatever it is, I don't st- I've told you this. I don't just put prayer on the schedule to make it look like I'm, I'm super spiritual. I put prayer on the table and on the schedule because we need to understand that if we don't pray, God might not move in our midst. But if we do pray, we will see Him move. And that's why I call you to come to prayer. And I am urging you to put it on your calendar when we announce that, that prayer is happening, that you change your schedule because there is no more important place than you can be than at the foot of Jesus Christ. And how else are you going to learn to pray if you don't pray? So please, for your sake and for ours, join with us in prayer because prayer makes a difference. Let me share this with you. Visitors to the famous gallery in St. Paul's Cathedral, London, can hear the guy's whisper travel around the whole dome, the sound bouncing back many times from from the smooth walls. And if you put your ear close enough, they say, if you put your ear close enough to the wall, you can hear what someone else has whispered on the opposite side of that dome, even though it might be in a low tone. A number of years ago, a poor shoemaker whispered to his young lady that he could not afford to marry her as he hadn't had money to buy leather and his business was ruined. The poor girl wept quietly as she listened to this sad news. A gentleman on the other side of the gallery, which was 198 feet across, heard this story from this shoemaker as he whispered it to his girl. And he he prayed. And he decided, this man decided to do something about it. When the young shoemaker left the St. Paul's uh, Auditorium Cathedral, this man followed him to find out where he lived. He went out and he purchased some leather and had some leather shipped to that man's business. That man took that leather and used it to save his business to be able to marry his girl. It was not until a few years later that he found out who this friend was. It was the Prime Minister of Great Britain, W.E. Gladstone. There is always one above us who hears our prayers. It doesn't matter if it comes from the depths of the soul. He hears our prayers. We may think, I don't know if He will answer, but I can tell you, if you don't pray, He won't hear it. Pray. Say that again. Pray. I'm going to say it again. Pray. I'm going to say it again. Pray. A believer needs to pray and to believe. And when we pray and we believe, God hears our prayers. Prayer is about asking, but... It is also about helping us stay in touch with Him. It helps keep us grounded and focused on Him and not trying to live our life the way that we want it to be lived. We say, Father, it's in Your hands that I commit these situations. It's into Your hands that I commit this life that I have. And it's not my will that be done, but Yours. Can you imagine if Jesus didn't pray that prayer? Where would you be today? 
He believed in prayer. And prayer should be more about just asking for what we want. Prayer should be asking and seeking God to help other individuals. And we should learn how to intercede and to pray for the needs of others. That's why we share prayer requests. That's why we have a prayer request list. That's why you should be involved with others that are praying. Even at this morning as I was praying, one of my pastor friends, he was pointing out there that he was speaking in a church today. He was concerned about the message. And he was saying, will you guys please remember to keep me in prayer today? And we're like, brother, we're praying for you today. And others were saying, not only am I praying for you, but I'm praying for all of you guys that are in this text message today. Why? Because we want the Spirit of God to move amongst our midst. And the only way that that's going to happen is through prayer. Corey Ten Boone, a Holocaust survivor, said this, Any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made out into a burden. John Bunyan said this, In prayer it is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. Know your God. Know what He is speaking to you. Be intimate in that. And that comes through prayer and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. God can hear your heart's cry. Be willing to give Him your needs. Be willing to lift up the needs of others because He cares about them. That's why He came and died. He didn't come to die so that we wouldn't know Him. He came to die so that we might have life and life to the full and to have hope for a future. So pray. Because He's up there saying, I want to hear your needs. I want you to connect with Me. I want to be able to bless you. That's why we're going to believe in prayer. Because it makes a difference. I came across this in my preparation. Cary Grant said, if you don't have faith, pray anyway. If you don't understand or believe the words that you are saying, pray anyway. Prayer can start faith, particularly if you pray aloud. And even the most imperfect prayer is an attempt to reach God. Let it out! Oswald Chambers said, prayer does not equip us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. Oh, think about that. So when we pray, we are doing battle. And if you've seen my post about the time that we get done praying, and you know, I'm asking you to come to prayer meeting, I've been talking about we're going to battle. When we pray, we're going to battle. We're, we're not just sitting in a room for an hour. We're actually picking up the sword. We're actually picking up the Word. We're actually going to our Lord and say, God, help us, lead us, guide us, direct us. God, we pray that You would be with this ministry. God, we pray that You would be with this person. There is battle that is being done. And there is no greater battle than the battle of fighting with the Word and fighting in prayer. Prayer is mighty and it will propel the church forward. And if we do not pray, we will not bear the fruit that we should be able to bear. We should see great things happening. But that will happen when we pray. Prayer is our lifeline between us and the Father. And prayer is a must for every believer. If you claim to be a believer of Jesus Christ, you ought to be about prayer. Not because I'm saying it, because that's what God said in His Word, that He believes and His people prayed for one another. The second aspect that I believe that we should be praying or we should be involved in believing for is a life that is full of praise. Full of praise. Francis Chan, in his book, Letters to the Church, he wrote this about one of the goals that he had when starting up one of his churches. He says, first I wanted all of us to sing directly to God. And I mean really sing. I'm not talking about going through the motions of singing out of routine or guilt. Have you ever been a part of a group of people actually singing directly to God? Singing with reverence and emotion. Singing as though God is really listening to their voices. That is a powerful experience. And I wanted it to be the central part of our new church. Praise. I've had a couple of those opportunities in my life. I remember being in the Silver Dome, the Pontiac Silver Dome, for a men's conference with I don't know how many, thousands and thousands of men. I've been in other conferences where there's thousands of people lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in praise and adoration. It's a powerful experience. But you know what? I can have that same experience in my own prayer closet, in my own time, because there is only an audience of one, and that is Him. 
See, when you gather in this place, you're not singing to to me. You're not singing to the worship team. You understand that? Your praise, your adoration, your worship is all to be lifted up to God. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. You have come to worship Him and Him alone. So there is only an audience of one and sing. And you will walk into His presence. You will walk into His life and He will bless you. So to praise God is to bring attention to His glory, to exalt Him for who He is. And we have plenty of examples in Scripture. So I'm going to give you, I don't know, five or so of these again. First Chronicles chapter 16, verses 23-26 through 26 in the New American Standard says this, Sing to the Lord all the earth. And I put the emphasis on all for a reason. Because that includes you. All the earth. Proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Remember last week? Experience Him daily. Here it is again. Tell of His glory among the nations, His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. There is so much there to praise Him and thank Him for. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 13. Sing unto the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. For He hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of the evildoer. Was anybody else weak and lonely and needed a Savior? That is for us. Psalm chapter 100 says this. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endureth to all generations. Psalm 33, 1-3 Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to Him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to Him a new song. Some of you don't even know what that is. You, you've got to be in prayer. Let that, let that spirit go. Make up your own words. And sing joyfully, play skillfully, and shout for joy. He deserves our praise. And we believe in that. And we will exalt that. And we will exalt Him because He is worthy. Praise is important because it reminds us of who He is. I remember being a young man. I remember being a younger man. And I remember being now a middle old man. <laughs> How many of you know that the enemy wants to destroy our lives and just tempt us and weigh us down? But the Word says, if you will put on the garment of praise, that spirit of heaviness, when you don't want to come to church, come to church and praise Him. It will change your life. Get in the prayer closet. Spend some time saying, i got to take a ten minute break. Get in the radio. Do something. Get in the Word. Start singing your praise to the Lord. It will change your life. It reminds you of who He is and that He's bigger than any problem that you have ever faced in your life. And He is capable of doing whatever is needed to be done. And it pleases us. It pleases Him. And it places our perspective in the right place. It reminds us that there is a God that is bigger than me. There is a God that is bigger than my problems. There is a God that is bigger than my situation. There is a God that is bigger than cancer. There is a God that is bigger than you fill in the blank. Because there is a God that is big enough. And praise Him. That is, if we give it from our heart, like Francis Tam was talking about and speaking about, it will change your life. And again, I'm asking you not to come in here to sing for my glory. I appreciate it. It makes me feel good. I'm sure it makes you feel good too when you know you're not the only one singing, right? It does. But listen, there's only one that you're responsible to give praise and glory to. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Lift up your praise. I mean, it says, make a joyful noise. Now, if you can't sing on tune, try to keep it down a little bit maybe. But give it up! Let me say that again. Give it up! Because He is worthy to be praised. 
C.H. Spurgeon said this, When your heart is full of Christ, you want to sing. I love to praise Him. I love to worship Him. John Wesley was about 21 years of age when he went to Oxford University. He came from a Christian home and he was gifted with a keen mind and good looks. And yet in those days, he was a bit snobbish and sarcastic. One night, however, something happened to set in motion a change in Wesley's heart. While speaking with a porter, he discovered that the poor fellow had only the one coat and lived in such an impoverished condition that he didn't have even a bed. Yet he was unusually a happy person, filled with gratitude to God. Wesley, being immature, thoughtlessly joked about the man's misfortune, said, and what else do you want to thank God for? And he said with that sarcastic tone. The man smiled and said, the spirit of meekness replied with this. He said, enjoy. I thank Him that He has given me my life and being a part of it, a heart to love Him, and above all, a constant desire to serve Him. Deeply moved, Wesley recognized that this man knew the meaning of true thankfulness. Many years later, in 1791, John Wesley lay on his deathbed at the age of 88. Those who gathered around him realized how well he had learned the lesson of praising God in every circumstance. Despite Wesley's extreme weakness, he began singing the hymn, I'll praise my Maker while I have breath. Can you say that today? Can you say, I will praise Him with all that is within me? Praise is clearly a matter of the heart. If our heart is not where it should be, we will have a difficult time praising Him. He gave His life for us, and it is incumbent upon us that we exalt His name and we give Him praise for all He has done and for all He is. So search your heart. Dig deep and sing your praise to the Lord with goodness and gladness. My final point this morning is this, about what we should believe and we should understand what true worship is. We have been created for His pleasure. We, man today thinks that they've been created to find their own source of pleasure. They will find it in pornography. They will find it in a psychic. They will find it in alcohol. They will find it in drugs. They will find it in money. But that's not the reason we have been created. We have been created to bring worship and adoration to our Lord and King. He made us to worship Him. Isaiah chapter 43 says, Everyone, starting in verse verse 7, says, Everyone who is called by My name, whom I created for My glory, whom I formed and made. And then down in verse 21 of Isaiah chapter 43, it says, In the people I formed for Myself, that they may proclaim My praise. John chapter 4, verse 24 says, God is spirit and His worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Can't get away from this verse. Then He said to them, Whoever wants to be My disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow Me. I think I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. When we gather together, I know we often refer to our time of music as praise and worship. And and I believe that there is praise and there is exaltation and there is a part of worship in that. But let me tell you something. Worship is not just a 15 or 20 minute slot or maybe 30 depending on where you're at. It's not that time frame of of the week that we call praise and worship. True worship is a lifestyle. It's how you live your life. That's why He says that those who will come after Me, that they must worship Me in spirit and in truth. Does truth ever go away? No, it exists 24-7, 365 or 366, depending on what year we are in. 
And that's why I like Luke 9.23 because it says that we must be willing to take up our cross daily and follow Him. That's a disciple of Christ. That means we understand that we are going to live our life in such a manner that it is exalting to whom we are following. And in this case, it is God Almighty. That is what worship is about. It is not the same as praise, although I think they are conjoined and intertwined at times. But praise is exaltation given to God. But worship is really the way that you live your life every second of the day. And that's exactly, exactly what I want. And I understand it's not easy, right? Anybody with me on that? You understand it's not easy. But that should be our goal. That should be our purpose to live in such a manner that we are giving honor and we are saying, I will be a witness of Jesus Christ. Zane Holmes said this, Christianity is a come and, Christianity is a come and go affair. We come up to the mountain, but we must go down, back down again. We come to worship, but we must go out and serve. What is he saying? That everywhere you go, that you need to be involved in what is happening in the exaltation of who God is in your life. Now, I'm going to keep my head buried in my notes for just a minute because I was putting this together. I believe the Lord helped me with these couple of paragraphs and I want to make sure that I say them exactly like I have them written as He was leading me in this. I want you to listen carefully. We cannot truly satisfy our commitment to God if we are not willing to give Him every day of our life. Coming to serve once a week might satisfy a commitment, but it is not satisfying your heart. It is only a band-aid applied to the sore of the heart. If we get the right perspective of what true worship is, we will have something that will challenge and push us in life. We will praise Jesus for who He is and God as our help and strength. We will be so consumed with love for Him that we will not have time to contemplate our sin and temptations because we will be hungry for His righteousness. We will be so thankful for His grace and mercy that it will drive us to care for the lostness of man. True worship is more than words of expression to God for who He is or what He has done. It is being willing to live out our life according to His commands. It is learning to be a disciple of Christ willing to do the best that one can to become as close to the likeness of Christ as possible. That's worship. Saying, Father, I, You gave me Your life. And I'm going to do the best that I can to give You mine. And to trust You to lead me, to guide me, to direct me, to form me, to mold me and make me. Because this is what the New Testament believers did. They gathered together regularly to encourage one another, to pray for one another, and to study the Word. And that meant being witnesses of Christ everywhere that they went. They did not hide from the truth. They presented the truth. Think about that. Being a Christian means more than going to church once or twice a week. Being a believer is recognizing that my life is worshipped to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords, that He's my Savior. We believe that it is each believer's responsibility to be the best worshiper possible. Think about what that means. Again, please, I believe that singing and giving adoration and glory to God is part of our worship, but that's only a part of it. If you think that that's worship to Christ, you're missing out. Your life is worship to Him. Every moment of your day. We believe that each of us should have an opportunity to learn to become as powerful of a disciple as we possibly can. That's why we gather together. Because it's encouraging to one another. It helps us present the Gospel. But listen, we can't just be Christians when we're in here for an hour or an hour and a half. We are talking about living our life out in the marketplace. That's the life He's called us to live. 
And we will earnestly seek to make this happen to the best of our ability by providing opportunities for us to come together and for us to serve. Because when we are serving, we are worshiping Him because He came to serve us. And as we go and serve others, we are worshiping Him because we are being faithful to Him. Max Lucado said this, When you recognize God as Creator, you will admire Him. When you recognize His wisdom, you will learn from Him. When you discover His strength, you will rely on Him. But when He saves you, you will worship Him. (laughs) When you understand what God has done in your life, we should not have any other obligation than to say, God, my life belongs to You. Because you set me free. Let me conclude this morning. As I was preparing this message, what struck me was that prayer, praise, and worship need to come as an extension from our heart. If our heart is not right, we're going to have a hard time praying. If our heart is not right, we're going to have a hard time praising Him. If our heart is not right, we're not going to care about worshiping Him in spirit and in Truth. It is our heart that we have got to guard. It is our heart that we have got to feed. It is that inner part of us that says, I have got to crave all of God that I can get in my life so that I can believe in prayer and pray and believe that we will see results. That I can praise Him. And I believe as we praise and exalt Him, His Word says that He will be enthroned upon the praises of His people. That we walk into His very throne room. And when we walk, when we walk into His very throne room, then people's lives are changed. Now think about this. If you are doing that on a daily basis at home, then where you go, He goes. Are you seeing this? See, we don't need to have people come into this church to get saved. I want it. I want that to happen. But let us not. This is not the only place that the Holy Spirit resides. The Holy Spirit resides in your life. And when you get your heart right and you're hungry for Him, that He lives in you, and you go out, and people will know that He is there in your life, and they can come to know Him right there. Why do we wait to have them come to church? And even if we we don't invite them, guess what? They're not even going to come. There are people that are lost out there looking for hope in their life. And we've got it if we'll just grab it. Hold on to it and say, God, help me. Let me be that kind of worshiper that lives this life that You have called me to live. And I'm telling you, if you will do that, people will see that and doors will be open to you and don't be afraid to walk through that door and ask them, do you need Jesus today? Let's pray. And then we'll help them. And we'll help you. Build them up. Because remember, that's only the beginning. Next comes discipleship. And we're going to believe that miracles are going to take place through prayer. We're going to believe that the presence of God is going to be in our life. We're going to believe that we can worship Him in spirit and in truth. Because that's what the New Testament believers did. And that's what I believe He's calling us to do. Amen? Let's pray. Can I encourage you to pray? Can I encourage you to Praise Him. Can I encourage you to worship Him? And again, worship is about a lifestyle. And it takes time to learn that lifestyle. It it, it takes effort. It takes work. And I understand that you're going to have ups and downs. I have them myself. But let's get into the Word enough to know this. That He will help us every moment of the day. He's not leaving our side. He is walking with us.